As he took office in 1933, President Roosevelt navigated the banking crisis with a national banking holiday that forced banks closed, preventing anyone from withdrawing their money, followed immediately by a banking bill designed to restore confidence in banks and get customers to deposit the cash they were hoarding. A few months later, this was followed by a more substantial banking bill that has come to be known as Glass-Steagall after the two senators who pushed it through. The main provision of Glass-Steagall separated commercial banking from investment banking. Prior to the law, banks could and would frequently use depositor money to buy securities like stocks in corporations or to speculate on their value. This exposed banks to the risks of the stock market, and when the market would crash as it did in 1929, depositors would be rightly worried that their bank had lost too much money in the turmoil. With Glass-Steagall, that was no longer allowed. Commercial banks which took in depositors' money could not buy and sell a significant number of securities. Now, only investment banks, which took in investor money for the explicit purpose of buying and selling securities and speculating, could do those things. In essence, Glass-Steagall separated banking for Main Street customers from banking for Wall Street investors, breaking the connection and reducing the risk commercial banks expose themselves to. More importantly for depositors, Glass-Steagall established the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures bank deposits with a pool of money collected from banks. Private insurance, of course, already existed, and many depositors preferred to keep their money at a bank where those deposits were insured, so that if the bank failed, the insurance company would pay them back the money in their savings account. But the massive wave of bank failures that sunk us into the Great Depression also put those insurance companies under, unable to pay so many claims all at once. The FDIC would operate like one of those companies, usually running a surplus in funds. But when things got apocalyptically bad for banks, the FDIC would have the full faith and credit of the U.S. government behind it. President Roosevelt was opposed to the FDIC and threatened to veto the bill over it because he was worried that the federal government would not really be able to come through during a depression-level event but he was convinced by the authors of the bill that the mere existence of the FDIC would hopefully prevent that. Both sides turned out to be right, to a degree. During the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s, the FDIC depleted all its funds and needed $153 billion in taxpayer money to pay out all of the insurance claims from depositors. Nevertheless, the reason the whole idea of bank runs has seemed foreign to you, like a problem that doesn't exist anymore, is because of the FDIC. Today, the money in your checking account is insured up to $250,000, which means you can relax and not worry about losing it all in a crisis like they did prior to 1933. Glass-Steagall effectively solved the problem of bank runs, though in 1999, Congress repealed the parts of the law which separated commercial and investment banking, a decision which haunted, and some say worsened, the 2008 financial crisis. But we'll get to that in a few chapters. Beyond just addressing the financial sector, President Roosevelt also wanted to deliver immediate relief to regular people. In April of 1933, he pushed through legislation establishing the Civilian Conservation Corps, which hired 500,000 young men by 1935 for any and every public works project that could be found, such as building roads, bridges, shelters, power plants, parks, and more. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration came shortly after in May and gave grants to the states for relief programs. Like the CCC, the aim was to fund public works projects identified by the states, which would then hire unskilled labor to complete them. FARA funded state-level works programs, but also formed the Civil Works Administration to fund $400 million worth of projects around the U.S. 
while it would have been cheaper and more effective as economic relief to just give people the money spent on these projects, the attitude and morality of the day led both Americans and Roosevelt to prefer the sprawling bureaucracies needed to put them to work. In the end, they laid 12 million feet of sewer pipe, built 255,000 miles of roads, 40,000 schools, 3,700 playgrounds, and almost 1,000 airports. The economic decline bottomed out in 1933, four years after the recession had started. But where past recessions had a pattern of a rapid drop followed by a slow recovery, the Great Depression was four long years of rapid drop after rapid drop. But Roosevelt was determined to see a speedy recovery. Indeed, in 1934, with the banking crisis resolved and the government putting millions to work, the economy grew by a staggering 17%. And in 1935, the economy continued its fast-paced growth with an 11.1% increase in GDP. But even with these incredible growth rates, unemployment remained stubbornly high and was still at 20% in 1935. Roosevelt pushed several more major pieces of legislation through in 1935. In addition to another banking act, which empowered the Federal Reserve with greater ability to regulate banks and combat panics, Congress passed the Works Progress Administration. It replaced the Federal Emergency Relief Administration from 1933 and was given $5 billion, which amounted to 6.7% of GDP, to put Americans back to work. It was the most divisive of FDR's policies. In a 1939 poll, 23% said that it was the worst part of his New Deal, making it the most unpopular program on the list. Many Americans didn't like this level of government intervention and spending. But that same poll showed that 28% of Americans thought it was the best part of his New Deal, making it the most popular program on the list. Also in 1935, the Social Security Act was passed, creating one of the most lasting and beloved institutions of the American government. Social Security would provide a direct monthly payment to seniors, at the time the poorest group in America, which was left particularly poor by the Depression, funded by a payroll tax paid by employers and employees on the income that they earned. While the first benefits would not be paid until 1940, the payroll taxes started in 1937. This, along with a tax increase on the wealthy mandated by the Revenue Act of 1935, revised in 1937 to close loopholes, meant a much larger tax burden on just about everyone. While 1936 and 1937 saw record growth and significant drops in unemployment, 1938 saw another brief recession pull back on that progress. Luckily, this time the downturn was short-lived and the economy was bouncing back in 1939 as well as in 1940 and 1941, when unemployment finally dropped below 10%. The success of the New Deal is debated to this day. While most agree that Roosevelt managed to end the banking crisis, many contend that, this, that these programs to put people to work put capable men to work doing useless things and may have slowed the recovery. John Kenneth Galbraith, a prominent economist who worked in the Roosevelt administration, said that the real impact of the New Deal was to give market power to those who did not have it and act as a countervailing power. Workers who took jobs with the WPA were paid well and reliably, in contrast to the common seasonal unemployment and unreliable paydays they faced in jobs in the private sector. These workers had choices now, and private employers had to improve pay and job security to compete. Roosevelt saw himself as saving capitalism with his efforts. He avoided programs which put private companies under government control or regulated their activities, as was done in Soviet Russia at the time. 
Instead, he wanted to create government-run programs which would compete directly with private businesses and act as a sort of yardstick for efficiency, for any private business should be able to outcompete the slow and bureaucratic government. Of course, at the end of 1941 came the attack on Pearl Harbor and the U.S. entry into World War II. While historians credit the war with finally bringing an end to the Depression, economists do not. The economy was recovering and would have continued to recover without diverting valuable resources to unspeakable human destruction. However, with those who enlisted no longer part of the labor force, the unemployment rate did normalize quickly as the U.S. prepared for war. But the economics profession itself was in turmoil. The Great Depression stood in contrast to the theories of quick recoveries and the impossibility of a long-running collapse in production. And while Roosevelt was delivering on his promise of action, an economist in Britain was finishing his magnum opus, which would attempt to explain recessions and their recoveries in a completely new way. It was a theory he had been developing since the early 20s, when he wrote a book decrying the economic consequences of the treaty that ended the First World War, in which he predicted the world war the U.S. was now marching into.